I um, just want to remind you that the, all these people, they're actually libertarians and they they appreciate what, your work greatly, but they, in a way, they sometimes, uh, with few of these next questions, they want to give you a little bit of a hard time. It's fine. So, um, here we go. If everybody S agreed with me, it would be a very boring work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, Sven Sambunyak asks, Friedman says that he is an anarchist, but not also a, an anarcho-capitalist of Austrian orientation. He also said says that, like his father, he's a supporter of Chicago School. His father supposedly said that he's the meth methodological Keynesian. How does David Friedman reconcile his anarchism with Keynesian elements of the methodology of his father? I'm afraid I do not know where that quote is from or what it meant. There is a... Is it true? I don't know. The, the, the quote that I know, which was truncated by, I think, Time magazine, okay. was... In one sense, we are all Keynesians now. In another sense, none of us are Keynesians. And time made that we are all Keynesians now, which is a somewhat misleading quote. And I think his point was that Keynes's work changed the way economists thought about certain questions, but they did not end up with the same conclusions that Keynes did. So he had a real influence, but does not mean that people agree with him. And I don't know what the questioner thinks Keynesianism is, because a lot of conservatives and libertarians seem to use Keynesian as a sort of a general label for everything they don't like. That the, Austrians re especially. the real content of Keynes' edition, I think, was a theory of why you got involuntary unemployment, of why you got things like the Great Depression. And the theory implied that you might be able to prevent that by having government fiscal policy in which a government ran a deficit when unemployment was low and a, when it was high and a surplus when unemployment was high. And that, it seems to be, really is Keynesianism. But uh, what Chicago School economics and Keynesianism and Austrianism really are, are parts of neoclassical economics, of the set of ideas that were worked out by Marshall in England, by Menger uh, and Valra in Austria, uh, by, I'm forgetting, uh, there's, there's somebody in France whose name I'm now forgetting who did a mathematical version, but they were all fundamentally making the same kinds of arguments in different forms. Uh, and methodologically, uh, what I see as the Chicago School methodology consists of a combination of theory and empirical work. That is, you use economic theory to produce plausible conjectures about the real world, but because the world, real world is sufficiently complicated that you can almost never rigorously prove by theory that something must be true, you then test your conjectures against real world data. And some Austrians, but I think not all, think the right methodology is pure theory. And the problem is that it is difficult to imagine any prediction about the real world that is inconsistent with economic theory if you have a sufficiently broad view of what the facts might be. Uh, the way I put that in one of my books was, why am I standing on my head on a table holding a burning thousand dollar bill between my toes? It sounds like irrational behavior. Because I want to stand on my head on a table holding a burning thousand dollar bill between my toes. That is to say, if we don't know what's in the utility function, if we don't know what people desire, we can't predict what they will do. And any behavior that seems to be irrational in terms of what we expect people to want could be rational in terms of some odd set of desires. Uh, so in that sense, you can make plausible guesses because we know a good deal about what human beings are like being humans ourselves, but you can't make rigorous conclusions. And therefore, you want to test your theory against the real world. There are two other reasons you want to test it against the real world. Uh, one of them is you might have made a mistake in your theory. It might be you thought you had proved something and you really hadn't. And when the facts tell you your conclusion is wrong, that makes you go look at the theory. But another is that in my experience, figuring out how to test your theory against the real world is a good way of forcing yourself to think through the theory more clearly. And that was my conclusion from my first published journal article, which was an economic theory of the size and shape of nations, in which I claimed 
to explain the general features of the map of Europe from the fall of the Roman Empire to the present. So it was a very ambitious theory. And I submitted it to the Journal of Political Economy, and George Ziegler rejected it. And he rejected it, explaining that in order for it to be published in his journal, I had to have some kind of empirical tests of the theory. And he had some suggestions of tests, none of which I concluded were workable. But I figured out some ways in which I could actually make predictions from the theory that I could test. And in figuring that out, I improved the theory. I had to turn, change from rather vague verbal statements to more precise statements as of saying, what can I say about the real world if this theory is true, is a way of making you think more carefully about what your theory says. Now here's an interesting related question to what Sven was kind of alluding to, which is, um, why aren't there more uh, Chicago School economists and anarcho-capitalists? That's an interesting question. I don't know how many there are. My impression is that there are a reasonable, that, I mean, there aren't very many economists who are anarcho-capitalists at all, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, my impression is that uh, there are a number of people who are sympathetic to anarcho-capitalism, some of whom would say it might work and it might not work, people like Brian Kaplan, Peter Leeson, uh, who don't identify themselves as Austrians, who as far as, I don't know if they identify themselves as Chicago School either, uh, that after all, von Mises was not an anarchist, and he is sort of the leading extreme uh, Austrian, at least according to, to Rothbard. Uh, Mises was indeed not even a very hardcore libertarian, that he argues in various places in favor of the draft. He argues in favor of state subsidy for opera. Now, that may just be because he was an Austrian, <laughs> but not an Austrian economist. Really? He made such yeah, I am reasonably, I'd have to check it, but I'm reasonably certain that in human action, I know human action contains, at least an edition that I read, contains the statement that people who are opposed to conscription are the enemies of freedom. It's an almost exact quote. I have to have a little book to get the quote exactly. Uh, but somewhere I'm reasonably sure there's also an argument for subsidies for opera. Uh, so... I don't think it's, you know, what's basically going on is that Rothbard was an anarchist and an extreme Austrian, and people who follow Austria, follow Rothbard, therefore tend to be that. Uh, I remember, I think my father commenting at one point that he thought Gary Becker's political views were intermediate between mine and my father's. Uh, so he would not have called himself an anarchist, but I don't think he would have been that unsympathetic to the view. Uh, Jim Buchanan, I don't know if you consider him, I don't know quite where you classify himself. He considered himself a philosophical anarchist, though. I'm not, he, he wrote a very friendly but in, useful review of machinery of freedom, useful in that he pointed out a problem with my argument, which I've tried to deal with in the new chapters. Uh, so, uh, I guess maybe part of the answer is that Anybody who is willing to be viewed as a nut in one respect is willing to be viewed as a nut in other respects. That if you, that to the extent you, and I think you see this pattern in a lot of places, that to the extent that you reject what most people believe in one area, you are then more willing to do that in other areas. So in that sense, it's probably true that once you've sort of ruled yourself out of the society of ordinary economists by being an Austrian, you might as well throw in being an anarchist as well. Uh, but beyond that, I think most of it is just the historical accident of the fact mm -hmm. that Rothbard was both an anarchist and, and a pretty hardcore Austrian.